Hello. <clears throat> My name is Eric, and I'm the coordinator of collections and digital engagement at Dunlop Art Gallery. Welcome to tonight's program, NFTs and Artists. Before we get started, I would like to acknowledge that Dunlop Art Gallery and the lands on which we are virtually gathered this evening are situated on Treaty 4 territory. The original lands of the Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. NFT has been making waves in the art world over the past number of weeks with many questions surfacing around what they are, how they work in the digital art realm and what their use is for artists, as well as there are a number of possible ethical and environmental concerns many have. Aaron G joins us tonight to moderate the discussion around these non-fungible tokens. Hailing all the way from Regina, Saskatchewan, Regi or Aaron G is an artist and composer now based in Montreal who creates artworks that promote critical sensuality, effect, haptics, communication, and presence in sonic and digital architectures. Inspired by the human voice as conceptual object, she likens the vibration of vocal folds to electricity and data across systems or vibrations across matter. G is known for her use of physiological sensors to promote an embodied relation to algorithmicity. She is a DIY expert in effective biofeedback implicating the body of the listener as part of her cybernetic systems in place. Welcome, Aaron G. Along with Aaron, we have guests, Jeremy Bailey, uh, Alex McLeod, <laughs> and Ra Ellie. Jeremy Bailey is a self-proclaimed famous new media artist, podcaster, venture socialist, and head of expert experience at FreshBooks. Bailey believes that technology creatively misused empowers us all to be famous. As an artist, Bailey has performed and exhibited all over the world from bathrooms in Buffalo to museums in Moscow. At FreshBooks, a software company, he leads experienced design teams helping self-employed professionals thrive. Good point, his imperfect podcast collaboration with artist Raphael Rosendahl has helped thousands of creative listeners to be real and lean artist and artist accelerator founded in 2016 helps artists design and launch startups that challenge convention to actually make the world a better place. Ra is a video net and performance artist. Her multimedia and multi-character work investigates how race, gender and nationalism are performed and experienced through various technology and language and across culture, time, and space. Ra's work has been exhibited extensively internationally at spaces including Williams College Museum of Art, Miami Art Basel, Kuntaus Graz Museum in Austria, and Onassis Cultural Center in Athens, Greece. She has been the recipient of numerous awards, including the Chalmers Arts Fellowship, SSHRC Canada Graduate Scholarship, Studio Das Weiss House, and Artsland Georgia Fee Residency. Alex McLeod is a Toronto-based visual artist who creates work about interconnection, life cycles, and empathy through the computer as a medium. Prints, animations, and sculptures function as gateways into alternative dimensions, oscillating between the real and the imagined. McLeod holds a BFA from the Ontario College of Art and Design and a Master's in Digital Media from the Yates School of Graduate Studies at Ryerson University in Toronto. He has exhibited extensively at the provincial, national, and international levels. His work is held in private and public collections worldwide. Welcome, everyone. And to our viewers, sorry, hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> uh, to our viewers, please Hello. note that you are... <laughs> Please note that you are welcome to ask questions or leave comments for the artists this evening in the section below. Now, I will pass things over to Aaron. Please take it away from here. Thank you much so Eric for that uh, amazing introduction and thank you to the great panelists that have assembled here tonight to help uh, inform the public, I suppose, what exactly are NFTs? NFTs have been around for years, but they have become a very hot topic since Beeple uh, is, I guess I should explain Beeple as an artist, uh, was able to net 56 million in March for selling art using this technology. So what exactly is an NFT and why is everyone so excited about them? Uh, Jeremy, you are the square right beside me, so I'm going to ask you. 
No, why me? Uh, no, why I just told you why. <laughs> okay, all right, because I'm right beside you. All right. Okay, what is an NFT? Um, the best way, well, do, you, do I have to explain what the blockchain is? I like to explain, you know, when you I, go to a, okay. I, I gonna, think that like it, blockchain and how they work. They get that. Like, Everyone gets that. It's not even that they get that. It's just that I'm worried that this is actually not even the point. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Well, I mean, some people would disagree, but... Um, Okay, so the, the bottom line, the easiest way to understand it is um, an NFT is simply a reference to an artwork on the blockchain. <laughs> that is the like shortest form way of describing it. It's a link uh, that's you know on the blockchain that has ownership tied to it. So, um, and that link references an artwork. The artwork itself is actually not on the blockchain, just a reference to the artwork. It's the equivalent of like a certificate of authenticity for an artwork that exists on the blockchain. and the ownership attribution is what makes it exciting to people because you know if you if you have a certificate of authenticity maybe your name is stamped on it or something but um you know in theory the blockchain is this tamper proof historical record that no one you know that's decentralized and therefore will last for millennia and um yeah so what can we what can we get as an nft like what exactly do i get if i buy an NFT. Uh, I don't know who wants to take this one. Well, you can uh, buy all sorts of digital content and creation. You can buy mm -hmm. gifts, trading cards, uh, photos. A sense of ownership of being a part of something. Yeah, you, you can buy um, access, I think. Like, I think if you're, it's just like any like cultural currency, right? If you're like, I own the most expensive whatever, it is now suddenly you're part of another group. So it's like you are inadvertently buying other things than just maybe what the, the JPEG is. So I guess that when I buy an NFT, am I buying, how am I buying exclusivity? I'm trying I'm trying to play some kind of a person who's really does no idea what an NFT is. Like, what is it, what do you mean exclusivity? What am I purchasing a piece of paper? Am I purchasing a website? Like, what do I get? I'm getting a, I'm getting a link or something. <laughs> you know, okay. So if you have, if what you want, yes, you are getting your, so you, you are getting, <laughs> you're getting basically your uh, identity tied to that, that artwork. Uh, the, the transaction is visible that you purchased a thing at a specific time. Um, and you can also pass it along or resell it. The, that attribution can be passed along or resold or traded. Um, and so in theory, yeah, but, you're, but you are just getting, yeah, your name. It's like a, like a registry at a, you know, for a wedding or, or maybe like a guide or like, or like a, you know, when you're in, in a national park and you put your name down, it's like that. I was here at this time and had this, you know, and I got this thing. So I guess the more fun question uh, is why is everyone so excited about NFTs or maybe more specifically, why might you be interested in NFTs or excited about NFTs? Um, Ra? Yeah, I mean, I'm excited about some of it. I think when all the hype started like six weeks ago, I was maybe naively optimistic <laughs> about you know what this the potential of this for for artists for artists of color um maybe it was a way that we could you know bypass the the white elitist kind of gallery market um but then you know quickly i uh, just kind of revealed that it, it felt there it wasn't an, an equal um or a level playing field and um, I don't know. I think we're going to get into the the uh, the ethics and the ecological toll of it all after. But um, for me, some some things that I have seen that I think have been nice in terms of like uh, contributing to the discourse or adding to it is like um, like one thing that's obviously in line with my interests is like Pepe the Frog was reclaimed <laughs> as an NFT. Uh, that was exciting for me to see that uh it reappropriated from the from the alt-right and um edward snowden had minted an nft that uh the, then the proceeds went to his foundation so yeah i think there's a lot of kind of great things happening 
um, as well as like, you know, people selling $70 million at Christie's. So. Uh, Alex, what, uh, why do you think people are so excited about NFTs? I think uh, we've, we've, as a culture, has, have experienced like ongoing uh, pandemic that's made us uh, insane folk. So that anything like, no, I don't know. I think because, I think because uh, the art is, the art world has been like the wild west. It's like the only unregulated market. Um, so a lot of like, a lot of things can happen there, whether it's like moving money, hiding money. Uh, like I said about buying like access to, to like cultural like spaces. Um, and I think that mixed with uh, digital frontier where it's like, oh, I can, I can be part of this like, our world elite, or I can be part of this club, or I can have access and power is alluring to some folks, as well as like, it's, it's, it's a beautiful storm of that. Plus also like authenticity and authentication, whereas like any of my videos could be easily bootlegs, which I'm fine with, you know, but some folks aren't so fine with it. So they're like, oh, well maybe, maybe uh, this is a, a, a way to keep it secure. So there's, there's like a, a lot of circles in this Venn diagram that I, I think find, f uh, different folks find it alluring for different reasons. Yeah. But I think mainly because of coronavirus. Uh, Jeremy, what do you find most intriguing and promising about um, these developments? Uh, yeah, um, I think the most exciting thing is for, like I've been an internet based artist for, you know, going on way too long and uh, early, but not so long that Facebook and YouTube weren't the first platforms that I uploaded works to. And the total compensation I've received from both those platforms is negative. I've actually paid Facebook a tremendous amount in like advertising costs when I've done different performances, whatever. I've actually paid in more than I've gotten out. And I remember trying to monetize my YouTube videos and I think I made like 17 cents on 100,000 views or something. So I think artists for a long time have actually helped produce this great advertising product for two of the largest companies in the world, Google and Facebook, and have you know really been expropriated from and received nothing in return. So what I am really excited about in regards to NFTs is actually not the technology itself so much as the cooperation I'm seeing among artists, um, and it, including in some communities actually like just to counter raw for a second, there there's like on Hen, which is the one that no one can pronounce Hick and Nunk, there is like a diverse NFT artist group. And they even have, they've organized several exhibitions and there's little gallery spaces. There's this exhibition called Object for Object, which was very diverse. Um, and so I was really critical the same way because if you go on Foundation or some of the other platforms, it can seem like it's like the white male artist club. But I think what's most encouraging in the weeks that you know, since is that I'm seeing artists really congregate and cooperate to create the the means of production and the means of you know of actually earning a living for themselves um, without institutional gatekeepers or worse corporate gatekeepers which we traded we traded institutional gatekeepers for corporate gatekeepers and um, so I'm just like I'm excited for that. That's a long, long answer, sorry. <laughs> but I am really excited about that part. Yeah, well, um, Ra, I just wanted to give you a moment because you had posted in the um, pre-panel um, chat this link to a uh, feminist manifesta for, uh, that was by uh, Claudia Hart. Would you like to talk a little bit about what made you excited about that? Yeah, that really that new. is a really exciting piece, and it's. Sorry, I'm having I'm ha I don't know what's going on with the internet, um, but hopefully you can hear me and see me good. fine. I hear and yeah, perfectly. Claudia Hurt. Yeah, okay, cool. Yay. Uh, yeah, so Claudia Hurt had put published this article just yesterday, which was perfect timing and hyperallergic and she published her NFT for um, a feminist manifesta of the blockchain on feral, feral file um, platform, uh, which is like a curated platform. 
um, for NFTs. It's not it's not something that you can buy into um, like some of the other uh, platforms that we've been discussing. And she really kind of talks about this. Um, I mean, it, there's a lot. She goes over like Butler's performativity and and talks about Haraway's cyborgian identities and. But this um, beautiful kind of shift towards uh, from like a post photographic turn to what she calls this like minting the token as like an ontological shift in representation. I think that it kind of comes back to this question of, of authenticity because she was saying in, in the uh, in the in her write up how um, photography has failed us in terms of its authenticity and truth and. and and talking about the capital storm on January 6th and her friends taking selfie photographs and, and this kind of, yeah, it was very kind of dystopic, but she offered up this, this beautiful manifesta and you know, she, she critiqued the, the selfie pretty hard. And for someone who does a lot of lens space, uh, you know, uh, performance work, I, I think of the selfie as a, kind of more of like a, a desire to connect, uh, rather than it being just about the patriarchal gaze. But I think there, there's a lot there. There's a, it's a short read, but it's it, there's so much there. And, and I, I was excited. I was very excited about that. And that was probably one of the, the things. And that's why I shared it. And hopefully we can share that with the audience. Um, so when you mentioned that you have to buy into, because I, I hear what Jeremy was saying about how we're trading institutional gatekeepers for different kinds of ones, like what are the kinds of gatekeeping that are taking place exactly? Like in I terms think, of- Oh, like, are you asking me? Yeah, I think it depends on the platform. Like um, Ra's absolutely right. Like there are some that are created by artists, but then curated by artists. And they're definitely just bringing in certain um, people. And so there's, there's a form of social gatekeeping there for sure. Then there's like foundation where you have to be invited by an artist who sold a work on the platform, or you can go through this humiliating exercise of getting upvoted uh, into uh, the marketplace. So you you have to like go you know solicit votes from your fans. Um, and then but then there are some open ones. So the the, the one that I would definitely recommend people check out is the one that I, I mentioned. No one can uh, pronounce, but uh, hick and nook, <laughs> hick and, hick and nook. Yeah. But it's short. Sh people either say hick or hen is what I've come to understand, and and so I'm say I say hen. I'm in the hen camp. Um, but that's totally open source. The other big thing is it's low carbon. It's about it costs about as much as a tweet to mint an NFT, and that's a big criticism okay. of all of the platforms that use um, carbon intensive crypto, like specifically e ether. Uh, or Ethereum. And so it's like, it, yeah, so it's low carbon, open source, artist run, there's just a lot and it's, but it's completely disorganized and hard to use. I minted an NFT last night and actually sold it bef before I realized it was even on sale. <laughs> so it's like, but I did, but it went not for very much. I sold it way too low. I just didn't know what was going on. <laughs> the interface was so confusing. But uh, so, but I would still recommend it because it's evolving and there's like a, a very active artist network and you don't need uh, anything except about five bucks to get started on the platform using a different crypto called Tez, which is low carbon or Tezos. Um, so I guess that like this seems like an interesting time since you brought up um, the carbon issue um, to kind of get into um, what are the biggest concerns of <laughs> uh, the emerging technology and market. Um, Alex, do you want to cover your concerns? I think I think that this is like it's good that we're talking about this in relation to NFTs, and I'm glad that there are greener versions for it. But it's it's something that like is is always it's always a thing, and we're burning up carbon everything we do. Like you said, like even a tweet, even a Google search, even anything we do, even this like hate scrolling on Instagram is using up power it's like bouncing through multiple servers so i think if, if anything like this this like awful amount of co2 that's that's being created because of a lot of like people just producing minting things as a cash grab at least is a wake-up call to many folks to be like oh shoot like let me be more mindful about how i use the internet and so that i'm not mindlessly just contributing to this pollution um and if you can't stop 
the mindlessness then to like offset it somehow, whether it's built into the platform or you yourself as a creator, you're like, I'm going to donate some money to offset some of this that I'm creating. So I think if nothing else, at least it's something that we're talking about, you know, and it, which is, yeah, newish. I know that um, artist Sterling Crispin had posted something about how he felt that the traditional art market also had a lot of um, cost to it as well to the environment. Um, I don't terrible, know like all the yeah, the the private jets in Miami and all that stuff. All the art <laughs> no, it's crazy. It's like shipping, I, I, shipping artworks. Shipping yeah. artworks. Yeah, I was. I think it was the New York Times that mentioned that, like, um, the the footprint is the equivalent of basically driving of one NFT driving five hundred miles, which would be from Toronto to Quebec City. Yeah, I just think it's important to put that in perspective that it's not all NFTs. It's specific. It's it's actually relative to the crypto and and the blockchain being used. So again, again, like. Yeah, I think that's a problem. The mining. And yeah, but mm -hmm. but not all crypto is alike, and so right, um, it's worth it's worth kind of noting. At least mm -hmm. the the alternative I mentioned is like part of this green crypto movement that's evolved very quickly. But it's funny, like once you start posting about it, I was on Twitter, and it was like you know hundreds of people are jumping in and like you should do this and that, and there's a lot there's a very active community trying to make it better, um, of mostly artists, which is kind of really encouraging. Mm hmm. Um, Jeremy, what are some of your biggest concerns? Other, like, are there other ones other, other than what we've mentioned? Yeah, I mean, the biggest concern I think has been alluded to, which would be that we value art based on its monetary value first and foremost, rather than on its on other dimensions of value. Specifically, I do believe artists um, in artists having sustainable life, but I don't like the idea that the public would estimate the value of some art as greater or less based on how much people pay for it. Um, I just don't think that that that's like, it seems so cheesy to refer to like, and every I'm doing it too, like people sold for this or like, or a uh, Raph who I record podcast with, he's been selling the, his, his works for these like record prices, Raphael Rosendahl. And I think, I think it creates, it's awkward. I don't know. It's the same thing of, that made me feel like art fairs were awkward. Like a decade ago, we would have been on this panel talking about the feeling of art fairs are the future of art or something. <laughs> uh, and then we ended up with like a lot of selfie mirror based art. It was real crap. Um, and so I worry that it would just like dictate the terms of what's made and people will like, you know, it's almost like a form of art making for the patron uh, where the patron sometimes is actually not necessarily and we should probably bring this up, you know, could be involved in nefarious uh, ways of being that potentially corrupt the meaning of the art uh, being made. And it's just, you know, um, the transaction does matter to the content, I guess, is, you know, is, is, is fundamental. Um, and that's why I like the communities where artists are trading and where there's, it's, there's a little bit less barrier to entry and it's not hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars being spent for NFTs, but five or $10. Um, there's more like an economy of sharing. Really interesting points that you've brought up there. Um, Rod, do you have anything to add about like concerns that haven't been um, brought up or like um, what, what has been your experience getting into NFTs or getting like, you know, information about them? I'm not sure Rod can hear me. She's just on a me? delay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, well, one there are two cases that I thought were really interesting. One of them was this kind of uh, idea that it's a Ponzi or a pyramid scheme <laughs> where, we're, where, well, the distribution of wealth and, and who's really playing, it's basically like the 1% sharing the millions. Um, you know, between like Paris Hilton and Grimes and Elon Musk, it's like, you know, I think that's something that discouraged me from trying it out because I was like, okay, well, I'm going to pay for the gas fees and I'm going to pay for the fees and I'm going to post it up and, and it's just going to sit there floating on the internet and no one's ever going to buy it. Um, so, and then, you know, what what's the point at that 
yeah so it just felt like the market is saturated um but i didn't really think that i could you know make a space for myself it seems like a lot of people are ready to have a following and you know are we like just kind of contributing into upholding the the system or or helping to hype it up so these people at the top can continue to um circulate their money amongst their peers another really compelling case i thought was for the for the people uh argument and i think it was in artnet where they were talking about like the purists saying that um like the, the cutting the middleman out is part of the kind of artist to patron engineering of an nft and, and how christie's interfering in that sale uh contradicts that that entire kind of engineering so i thought i thought that was an interesting uh thing that was brought up by a, a collective of artists yeah I'll i hope that i hope i'm not getting cut off there no, no, no. It's it's all perfect on our end. I'm so sorry you're having trouble. Oh, um, good. Alex, okay, great. Well, no, that's okay. I'm good. Alex, did you have something to add? It looked like you were having some responses there to what Rob was putting out. <laughs> My face is just animated. I couldn't I couldn't <laughs> control it. It's just doing its own thing. I just think it, no. I I think you know Rob. Rob it's like really interesting. Um, I think this is all like we've got such a small view it's like tip of the iceberg i'm really really curious to see if and when this does evolve in the next like five ten years like does this become the norm for authenticity does it is it somehow imbued in in our digital arts culture like is there is there lasting power for this thing or is it a beanie baby and i think mm. i think that's that's the the thing is beanie babies i looked them up the other day they're still being traded and they're still there's like still a huge culture around beanie babies <laughs> the other thing i remind the, the other thing i was like thinking while you're both talking is like um i uploaded works like 20 years ago on different platforms that are still relevant i hope but i definitely know that works by other artists that were created 20 30 40 50 years ago even in the digital realm remain relevant some of them have been lost i think that's the bigger risk that these platforms might, you know, everyone talks about IPFS, like that all of the files get uploaded to the global file system. I don't know if that's something we need to introduce our audience to, but like most of the platforms support this idea that because they don't actually put the file on the blockchain, they're gonna upload it to a distributed network, uh, file sharing network, the interplanetary file system, IPFS, which I felt it feels like Star Trek when you're starting to describe this. Term. And that that means that the work will last longer, right? Like the idea here is actually for this work to subsist longer or to exist longer than most technology platforms do. Whether that ends up being true or not is probably the, you know, the, the harder question to, to answer because all standards kind of change over time. And we, you know, even we found with the old platforms, there's, you know, orgs like Rhizome that have created the Rhizome anthology to try and archive works that have been deprecated because they are built on top of uh, platforms that have evolved and, and no longer support the original intent of the artist. Yeah, I mean, yeah, digital preservation is like a major part of this too. Like I, I think, yeah, this all works now, but like you said, there's so many moving parts. Like does the work exist? Like you still might have the blockchain token, but if the work, you know what I mean, and 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 if you have the work, do can we open JPEGs in fifty years? You know, my my great aunt <laughs> yeah, well, NFT collection that I you know inherit, you know, a hundred years from now. Like, what what kind of interface are we looking at? Like, technology's changed so much in a hundred years. I can't imagine what things are going to look like in a hundred years from now. Wow, I'm just giving that a minute to sink in. <laughs> Wow. JPEG seems pretty safe though. JPEG's done, done really well. I'm also I can't really even imagine a JPEG not opening. I'm I'm, I'm definitely I'm yeah, team JPEG. Yeah. <laughs> um I was really interested in uh something that you said, Jeremy, about like um people making work in order to fit the platform. Can you talk a little bit about what that means or what you've seen or like can you can you extrapolate on that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, first of all. Yeah, it, like it, we're in Canada, right? Let's like get Marshall McLuhan up on stage or whatever. But it's really hard to separate the medium from the message in this particular case, um, or the media. And 
the interface in this case is often presenting the works in a certain way, right? The same way I referred to like art fair art being all selfie mirrors or like neon signs. The same thing is, you know, can happen in this realm and, and already is. And you can see that the platforms sort of entice certain styles of work, you know, because, you know, we're humans and we respond um, relative to the ways these things uh, exist. The same way Instagram scrolling you know, entices us to keep scrolling. But I think the one, just a few like technical things, a lot of the platforms favor like a square aspect ratio, um, even though when you click through, you get to a non-square aspect ratio. So like I put, I, I uh, minted an NFT last night and I was like, I gotta make it 1080 by 1080, though some people say you should do 2000 by 2000, but square aspect ratio is what I'm gonna do because I want it to feel pure, <laughs> like, like it belongs on the platform. Um, so the, the platform is best thought of almost like, um, a frame or a media like film or television, like a four, three aspect ratio, all of that stuff is sort of dictating some of the terms. So those are the technical terms, but then there's of course, all of the social terms um, of the people you know behind the platform and the people buying work on those platforms. Um, yeah, anyway, and that's the, the whole political thing I was referring to earlier. Yeah, well, uh... I think that the politics of like the aesthetics of NFTs are really, really interesting. Um, I, I'm i going to stick a little bit to the plan uh, and move on to this. We should talk uh, about money laundering, Aaron. Let's get okay. into it. Let's get yeah, into yeah, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's get it. <laughs> How do you launder your money? Okay, start, <laughs> step one. <laughs> um, <I'm> a, <laughs> I was actually going to, the next question was like, so if I'm an artist, I'm curious about these NFTs, how do I participate? But I mean, money laundering is a form of participation. <laughs> I actually don't even know if it's, I was trying to talk to an accountant on Twitter about this, whether it's actually possible to launder money this way, because you'd have to get your money out at some point. In the traditional art market, that's a lot easier. Yeah, asking for a friend, someone commented. Um <laughs> And you don't get like a charitable receipt. So I don't think it counts as an accountant on Twitter was telling me it could count as a tax write off in, in jurisdictions where buying art is, but I don't know if a crypto receipt counts as an art receipt. Anyway, there, I have questions if there are accountants on our channel that mm. can chime in. Um, but art has always been a great way to clean money or also like lower your taxable income. It's why people pay so much for art. And people are like, why do they pay so much for art? Because they're, you know, it's a great way to actually not get taxed. Um, and most artists benefit from that, or a lot of artists who sell work do. Alex is nodding his head like, yep, I've done no, it's animation. <laughs> it's animation. Um, yeah, but then the la the laundering side is, I think one one of the things to bring up is there are a lot of crypto whales, like people who um, you know, got into crypto early or have put their money in crypto because they're trading drugs or other illegal activity, you know, outside of the banking system as a factor of this is how I'm going to manage um, my activity. Just the same way like paintings have been used that way, you know, for centuries or whatever to ferry money around the world. So I think, um, I don't know, long story short, that's, it's, it's yeah. a thing. You can't really ignore. I'll get into it. Like it sounds <laughs> dope. Yeah. Like the I'm criminal sure part. Or the get into money laundering. <laughs> and then um, there's people that made a lot of money because crypto values just went through the roof. So there's the pyramid scheme part, I think, is that like the more we hype this up, the more it helps hype those people that already hyped it up. And so you know, there's a crypto bro factor here as well. That feedback loop. Yeah, that feedback loop. I think if you were a young artist, and this is speaking from me who has- I spent some time um, yesterday. <laughs> no, keep going. <laughs> no, it's just a, it's a funny- <laughs> Sorry, um, Rat. You, we, no, sorry, we're Rob, laughing because it, it was a funny interruption. Like you cut Alex right off because you're, you're on a different time delay, a slight time delay. But it's just a funny point where you cut him off. <laughs> um, uh, Raw, keep going. We'll get back to Alex. Oh, I don't. Um, sorry, Alex. Go I'll ahead. I don't know. I don't know how to fix this. What I was gonna say was <laughs> was that uh, if you're a young artist that wanted to uh, to get into this market, I think. I think because it's so oversaturated and overcrowded that you'd really have to do something different and special and and relevant and giving folks what they want. 
I think you'd have to make a giant splash and and you have to be like like you'd have to work really hard at that and you have to like maybe look at other people that do that kind of thing like who are the people doing big nfts who are the pe people doing big pop pop artist release albums like who are the, the people making memes like who are these folks that are getting cutting through all of like all of everything and and, and producing relevant content and i would suggest that they kind of adopt some of those uh techniques like not necessarily selling yourself out but be like doing it smartly because it's very difficult and i think that most folks that would just put up their work being an emerging artist would have no luck and they maybe spend so much money minting things and not have any sales in just hopes that they would you know what yeah. i'm saying so i think there's a lot of strategy that they could that they could take from what's already out there and you're right it does cost mm -hmm. a little it costs like 160 bucks basically you know, right now to mint on foundation as an example, and they take a cut, right? There's the idea of royalties built in that we haven't discussed. You can like on some platforms stipulate a royalty for resale. So the artist can continue to get paid for the length of the work. Um, so you could, you know, in theory, price your work low, get it collected, and then maybe like, you know, count on someone else trading it uh, or selling it again. And it's nice to be able to select your editions too. You can make it like a painting where it's a one-off or have, you know, an edition of 10, like a photograph or something like that. But yeah, one thing I was looking into because, you know, that's kind of my my interest uh, was to see what, if the alt-right has taken over any of the NFTs and if they're promoting any of their symbols. And I actually found a couple that I, that I took images of and reported, but it doesn't seem to be, uh totally um there's not a whole lot with the available symbols that i have access to and and know about i, I didn't find a ton of imagery but it, it was i was happy to see that discussion around pepe um but anyway that's just what kind of my my nft art has been this like hunting down nazis <laughs> and reporting them <laughs> Like, yeah, you're a Nazi hunter. That's great. Yeah, <laughs> I kind of am. Yeah, um, I like. Yeah, I think it's important to do that work, and you know, they. I think they have this really interesting kind of um, internet dialect, and I was just in interested to see if there were any images. And I found, I found one that I wasn't so sure. It was a Pepe image, but there was one that was like of the of the black sun with the the SS symbols. So I, I reported that one. That one was pretty obvious. But some of them, um, yeah, a lot of the 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 symbols I looked up, they weren't they weren't being used. What happens then if something gets censored in on these platforms if it's already sold? I guess then you can't censor it. It Is hasn't it been sold, and I looked at the creator too. I looked at the creator and there there was only one image. Uh, one of them with the Pepe had several images and that was the only one that, that seemed a bit problematic. But um, yeah, they, there was like no identity to the creator. Nothing had been sold. It only had about three views. So I reported it, it was on OpenSea. Uh, so I'll, I'll check again in a couple of days to see if that image is still there. I want to see what hap what what does like, happen to them if I report them. Like OpenSea, do they have any jurisdiction? Because it's really the. But I've been screenshotting like them anyway. Okay. What um what are some of the um ways that you have personally been involved in NFTs and like do you have advice for anyone just starting out? I know that we've already like talked a little bit about this, but I wanted to before we went into questions from the audience. I think that there's a lot of people that are here and also audience if you have more questions you can put them you know now is a great time for you to actually formulate them and put them in the chat um so that i can give them to our great panel um but uh more just to talk a little bit about the work that you've done that you know, in nfts the ways you're exploring it your experiences any advice you might have or like what we've already talked about about the hand um so um i don't know raw you were talking a little bit about your experiences or you minted one recently no i, I didn't mint one i wanted i was thinking about doing it in preparation for the panel but then i i just decided not to um yeah but i think jeremy has more direct experience with with having mint to several really not yeah not that much a couple but i you know and i think following closely like everyone here 
I'm actually surprised, Alex. Your work is almost perfect for the NFT realm. Like, is it because most of the NFTs are bad? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. It's not. <laughs> it's true. One, of the, one of the things I was going to say is there's no reason to sell your work online. You have to use uh, you have to use NFTs. Um, like for the last year or so, I mean, going back a longer way, but I, I launched like my own platform for selling augmented reality sculpture in the fall, and I've been selling other artists' work, digital downloads, and selling them, you know, handily, like not for a lot of money, but for twenty, thirty dollars, a hundred dollars a pop. And we've done a few thousand dollars on the platform just using like a Shopify store, like to sell. And so, you know, one of the first things I would say to folks is like, don't get, don't go selling NFTs just because you want to make, you know, you you feel like you, that's the only way. You can you can do it your way. There, you could get on eBay. You know, regardless, I think mm -hmm. they represent a shift in um, in how people are going to think about collecting and buying art, probably. We'd already heard that people were using Instagram to connect directly with artists. So I think for me, I would just, you know, I'm using it as an opportunity to encourage people to like, hey, you can own your own distribution. You can represent yourself. And instead of forfeiting 50%, I can't believe we haven't got into this yet, but like, you know, the traditional gallery system is a pretty unfair or raw deal for a lot of artists. Um, and I'm not saying, I'm not anti private gallery because there are some great ones out there. Um, and it, it's really hard to run a gallery. Like the business of running a gallery is extremely difficult. So I don't even know why anyone starts one, but like <laughs> the artist does not do well, uh, it should be stated. Um, and I'm always, you know, I think especially for young artists out there that are like, oh, if I just get that gallery, then I'm on my way. Um, you know, having been in and now out of a gallery um, and knowing where there, you know, that good galleries make a big difference in the, careers of my friends. Um, I, you know, I just think it's exciting to see people take things into their own hands. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you have to make work that's like readable and, and like you said, easily readable and consumable. And I don't, I don't think a lot of our, like a lot of us don't do that type of work, you know? Well, do you? I mean, yeah. the thing is, they're, they're I, like, I, don't, I don't think it's a platform for, for me personally. Like, I don't think anyone was going to buy, I don't know, Oreo art. Maybe, maybe film stills or something, but I don't know. It, it doesn't look like anything else I've seen on there. My work is like, I can't, I don't see anything else like that on there. So. But you do create raw like works for yeah. Instagram, right? Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, there are more, I, I mean, I think that they're more, you know, critical and I, I like the, the the aesthetic properties just don't seem the same. It's like a lot of I the more we'll kind of there. digital we'll content we'll um, that I've been seeing circulating. I think that, I think that we'll see more critical things and platforms that uh, I yeah, because this is such a new I hope so new baby. Yeah, I hope sure. so. It'd be like the yeah. first time somebody made a music. Like somebody's like, hey, listen to this song. And then somebody's like, no, no, I'm more into other things. It took them a while yeah. before they made another genre, right? I'm interested in this question of like critical though, because something that I think we've all seen emerge is like, it's kind of, I mean, like Alex, uh, you had just said right. like, oh, ha, ha. Is it because all NFTs are bad? But this is kind of a dominant discourse right now in relation to NFTs. And a lot of people are like saying that they're, they're um, low quality or like there's no substance, they're shallow, but I feel like I, I feel kind of uncomfortable with uh, this discourse sometimes. And I don't know if anybody else feels the same. You're saying if it's popular, then it must be trash. <laughs> like that, I mean, it's a, it's a common form of rhetoric against the folk artist or, you know, whatever label you want to tie to the non-institutionally gate kept artist. Um, yeah, I think it's it's a really problematic thing to unpack though. It's like that's a whole panel for sure. Mm. I don't know if what the other panelists think. I think like Yeah, well, I mean, I don't even think people identifies as an artist. Actually, in an interview he was like, I think identifying as an artist is pretentious. I'm like, well, you're clearly not in art circles because it's not. Yeah. <laughs> uh it's just, you know, it, <laughs> 
it's such a stereotypical idea of what an artist is, but you know, he's a graphic designer and has these big clients, Louis Vuitton and all this sort of stuff. So yeah, and then you have, you know, Paris Hilton and, and Grimes and there's there's different types of content circulating on there that's maybe not art in the way that we would define it or understand it. Um, but there are, oh, there are conceptual yeah. gestures and performances that are posted. I think we, there's a question in the chat around that. Right, I was just about to move into them, but if you want to take one away mm -hmm. before it. Well, just as an, like, there, there are like, um, there are definitely conceptual works or that take the form conceptually. Um, you know, there's obviously the most famous one is the New York Times uh, article or column that was sold as an NFT. But in theory, artists are playing with the format already and performing within the construct of NFTs. Um, the other thing I saw in the chat was um, AR NFTs. Just very quickly, you can mint an AR NFT I did last night on uh, on HEN. So go ahead and do that. There's um, But just DM, DM me on Twitter and I'll send you the code. But oh, on HEN, you can have custom nice. code, which is a big thing. Um, you can't do on the other platforms. Mm -hmm. It should be, We should note that most platforms only support images and video. But hen supports any pretty much anything. Um, cool. There's a question here about the kind of marriage between NFT platforms and Twitter, and from Lucas Paris, um, who says that he feels that the promotion of NFTs is mostly happening on Twitter, and Foundation is now forcing you to confirm that you have a Twitter account. Um, any feels either way? Like, is Twitter again is like a corporate power? Like, we're just, you know, kind of trashing that. Yeah, I guess it's weird. Like, <laughs> why do they need that? Because yeah. on, again, on Hen, identity is um, is all anonymous. I don't, I'm like become the super Hen promoter. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> there's that. <laughs> there's actually like a Google for real there's a google spreadsheet that you can send into an individual who would go and update the registry to add your name but by default <laughs> like that's how like lo-fi it is but by default right now everyone's anonymous and i think that appeals to like a certain sensibility right like some folks might want to buy art that's that's more uh, more about the work you know what i mean and if, if the artist wants to be anonymous doesn't want to have a twitter account you're buying the work and that's that's pretty freaking cool you know what i mean rather than buying it because oh this is this is uh ja rules uh nft you know so i'm gonna buy it because it's, it's who that person is not really about the work that ja rule made right is it pack anonymous the <laughs> the pixel oh yeah 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 it, the he the, yeah. the their I, work is i anonymous. actually love that one yeah I, I like that work. Um, Dan Harding has a question about um, just in general, uh, smart contracts and licensing deals are going to disrupt multiple sectors, sectors in entertainment, events, music releases. Um, does anyone have thoughts on non-art? And uh, I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, like non-artistic sectors? Like the Top Shot stuff. Have you used Top Shot? It's incredible. Mm. <laughs> it's like, it's the most sophisticated thing I've ever seen. It's so gamified. Like it's like digital, um, like play. It's like it's like magic meets digital Pokemon meets video, like NBA 2K. Um, it's so gamified. It's it, like it's definitely the future of art. <laughs> but it's just basketball clips right now. Is that what you're referring to when you're? Is that what? I'm. I, I you know I'm not an expert on this, but I do know that there were comments that I've heard about how musicians are going to use NFTs oh, yeah, yeah. in different kinds of ways. Um, like, for example, if you are someone who creates really generic music, you, you know, because everybody's, you know, selling things or making videos or whatever, and they just need some kind of music for the background, you now can sell that um, music as an NFT, and then it also sells the license. But then if this gets sold to somebody else, then you always continually get a cut every time that your music gets passed along. Um, I, 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 I really, I'm not sure about the details on that one, but I remember hearing it and thinking like, oh yeah, that sounds cool. Um, I don't know if anyone else has heard any cool rumors about 
other stuff though. Um, somebody was asking about what your favorite NFTs are, or if you have any NFTs that you really like. Um, that was from Vlad L Vlad Lunin. The pixel, raw like the pixel. I like Which the pack pixel. pixel. I also really like Claudia Hart's ma manifesto. It's a single pixel, and I, to me, it reminds me of that old work from the 1960s where the who was it that put the the box of shit in the gallery? <laughs> Come on. The person that put a box of shit. Dada, he had, he had canned his Piero, own shit. Piero Manzani, the can oh, right. of poo, the can of artist poo. It's the like here's a kind of pixel, poo? you know. It's it's so it's so it's, it's so absurd. It, there is humor in it, you know. It's kind of like a, I don't know, an f you to the viewer or something. I and I like that. <sighs> Just sit in silence. <laughs> Mic drop. Is it time to wave yet, Eric? Um, other works that, what other works have you all seen that you liked? I'm sure that, that we've been on there. Well, what's been amazing to been see, I guess, is some of the classic. What have you been posting, Jeremy? Well, I, I, saw, your, say... I saw your NFT today. I was going to, uh, yeah, well, we're like, yeah, go ahead, bid on. Bid on, bid on, bid on, bid on. <laughs> I'm not going to like miss this yeah. opportunity. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's pump up the price. Let's get the bidding yeah. going. I've got a foundation <laughs> NFT that needs to be bought. Come on. Daddy needs a new pair of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> These Facebook uh, <laughs> themselves. Yeah, exactly. Um, I was just going to say, though, that I've seen a lot of classic works. Actually, right now, I think, um, or just before we got on, Takashi Murata had one of these, his classic animations that I remember from the early 2000s from like the film festival circuit. So I've seen a lot of like classic works that I'd forgotten about that, you know, or mm -hmm. Petra Courtright put up some older works. Um, and so it's been great Petra, to see. Yeah. It's been great to see artists put up uh, some of those older works, not because they're getting paid big bucks for them, um, because in some cases they're not, they're getting maybe $8,000 or something. And the, the artwork might never have really generated very much money. It's famously impossible to sell a video um, coming from like a, a video artist. Um, and so it's been nice to see a lot of these works that I had forgotten about, or some of them anyway, either from film festivals or YouTube resurface. And then some like deep cuts, like behind the scenes stuff that no one ever released from earlier and you know like some of the archive stuff it's kind of like seeing the beatles like original recording of you know abbey road i don't even know i don't know enough about the beatles to get into it but <laughs> <laughs> it's been cool to see some of that archival stuff oh, oh kitty yeah we weren't supposed to allow cats in the room kellen spencer asks what opportunities for collaboration do you see with nfts I'm curious about ongoing projects and the longevity of an mm. NFT through continued use, transfer of ownership, or otherwise. What opportunities do you see for ownership? Yeah, well, that's what you know. One of the the collaboration part. I'm not sure if I I, I like follow that versus is it the longevity brand collaborations, like, or is it artist collaborations? You know what I mean? Because I like I'll get hit up with brands, and they're like, "We want to do collabos with artists," and that's that's starting to become a thing, so that they they can be a part of this world now. If it's if it's collaborating, it's like me and Ra, or me and Jeremy, or me and Eric oh, yeah. collaborating well, who, with the NFT. That's a different thing, right? But Alex, who owns the who owns the um, who own, who gets the royalties to a work if we collaborate? You know how do if the the attribution is to an individual? Yeah. I think the question is like. How do we, you know, how do you manage collaboration in that context? Mm. And I've seen like Ryder Rips has like an NFT up right now that he attributes to Nicholas Sassoon as like a 50% stakeholder on foundation. And he's just like, write it, he wrote into the description, I will give Nicholas Sassoon 50% <laughs> of the proceeds. Yeah, so it's like the honor system, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think you'd have to really trust who you're, you're working You know how that ends, yeah. especially with Ryder. Sorry. <laughs> anyone knows if anyone knows Ryder, if Ryder's listening. <laughs> I'm sorry, Ryder. 
somebody has asked the uh, question about proof of work versus proof of stake with um, Ethereum. Yeah, that's a big, big topic. That's why hen is the way to go. <laughs> it's, a, it's a proof of stake. <laughs> so, like proof of, proof of stake and concept is just a lot less, um, car, it's more carbon neutral. It's a lot less processor intensive, right? It doesn't require as much mining uh, or work. But you so. already have to have a certain amount of currency, right? Uh, yeah, it's like it's just the minting process is less expensive, right? And the and the verification yeah. process is less expensive. Mm -hmm. So I think that everyone wants to move to proof of stake. What I've heard though is that and Ethereum is supposed to, but everyone's not. No one's holding their breath, is what I've heard, because these standards don't evolve like you know that quickly. It's quite complex. Um, yeah, Chris, Christopher Coleman's laughing. There are people in this chat that know way more than I do, so I feel really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that Ethereum has been saying that they were going to move into proof of state since oh, basically since they launched. They've been around since 2015. So, yeah. right. We'll, we'll believe it when we see it. That was the question that I just uh, addressed. I heard that Ether, ETH, ETH 2.0 is supposed to significantly reduce yeah. emissions. That's true. But, it's, but when will it arrive is the question. And how do you sell your, your BFA on the blockchain, Chris? Because I want to make some money off of this. People are selling their degrees? I didn't know that. Chris is a teacher who asked that question, or professor, so he must be part of this whole scheme. He must be making bank. <laughs> yeah. Chris, come on. We got some artists in the chat. We got to support, we got to support our like-minded like people. In theory, I mean, I guess it's possible, but everyone knows that a MFA is like, I didn't know it had value. <laughs> <laughs> My, mine hasn't really done much for me. Well, um, <laughs> I know that there have also been people who were um, the original, like I guess the subjects in memes, they have been minting their memes yeah. as means of getting compensated for being um, meme fodder for all these years. Some mm -hmm. of them have made, uh, the one that made the most money was, um, uh, what's her name? Over Enthusiastic Girlfriend. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's some- Overbearing some Girlfriend, I think. Okay. Something. And other others have made significantly less. I think that ridiculously good looking jogging man has made not a lot of money with him. <laughs> Um, oh, Vlad Lunin just wanted to um, let us know that proof of space is the most carbon neutral blockchain. Mm. Get on it. Proof of space. I think, yeah, we're all proof of space. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> what, one thing we haven't mentioned is we haven't talked about some of the other platforms like um, Nifty Gateway or Super Rare. There are, there are like a, a myriad of platforms but one of the funnier ones, Nifty Gateway, I don't know if folks are familiar, it's owned by the Winklevoss twins. Um, like the ownership of these platforms is interesting, but specifically the Winklevoss twins, I don't know if you've read any interviews, but they were saying like, we made a big mistake with Facebook because famously they were like part of, you know, the original Facebook team. We didn't realize like people were selling, you know, we're, they were selling their content to advertisers. This is the revolution. Let's, let's, let's turn over the, the monarchy basically. But what I find amusing about that is it's like from these two like nefarious twins, like they're like it's almost like a super villain plot behind the scenes. Uh, the, whole thing. the sequel. Yeah, the, the sequel. But it's it's yeah, it's just crazy. Well, uh does anybody have any last thoughts before we close out the uh before we close off the, the panel? Get on hen. Try it out. I think trying it out. I was really Thank skeptical. You. Do you have and, to send us invite codes? Or can you... No, no, it's all free. Just try it out. <laughs> my hen, my hen, my hen people will be will be happy if I plug <laughs> hen one more time. <laughs> Stay changed of the original async. Okay. Well, thank you. Nice. Thank you. Yeah, that was lovely. Well, thanks everyone for these great answers. Um, I guess 
Oh, okay. I, I'm sorry. I <laughs> I'm not reading the I'm not reading the script correctly, but um, it seems as though our hour is up. So <laughs> that's a great. It's written right there at the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess unless there's any other questions from the audience, but it seems as though people are just saying thanks for the great discussion. Welcome back, Eric. <laughs> Thank Eric. you. Thanks for coming. Thanks everyone for this great discussion. Hi, Eric. Hello. Um, I'm here to say that we have come to the end of our program this evening. A huge thank you to Aaron, Jeremy, Ra, and Alex. And thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in to tonight's discussion. Uh, before we wrap things up, please take a moment to fill out an evaluation form. The link has, will be posted in the comments section. These are anonymous, and Dunlop Art Gallery values your feedback. And a reminder that you can watch this discussion along with many other artist talks on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Stay tuned for the next live stream event on Tuesday, April 27th from 7 to 8 uh, Central Standard Time with multiplay artists on Dunlop Art Gallery's Facebook and YouTube pages, where the artists Rebecca Kane and a number of multiplay artists will outline their work on their wider project. Be sure to register at reginalibrary.ca for an event reminder and receive the links to view. That wraps up our talk tonight for NFTs. I really enjoyed that. Thanks everyone for being a part of this. And yeah, stay tuned for more Dunlop pro programming and broadcasts. Bye. Bye. <laughs>